record. And so, um, Dr. Lee Willard is a graduate from the Institute of Medical Min Min Ministry at Burr Wildwood Lifestyle Center and Hospital in Georgia, and went on to be become a teacher of applied physic, physiology and nutrition. Lee is a certified holistic health practitioner and has also completed his studies as a master herbalist and went on to a degree in doctor, doctorate in naturopathy and is a volunteer teacher of botanical medicine at Andrews University. Just pinning that, um, I have dropped the link in the chat. Please uh, forward the link. Take this moment to forward the link because we have question and answer answers at the end. And uh, let me continue. He has also done multiple health programs on international television as well as radio and has done hundreds of seminars around the world. Lee has also developed an online herbal course that is designed to give the average layperson a solid foundation in understanding herbal remedies. In 2018, Lee started the American Herb Shop and has a successful online business that specialized in some of the best organic herbal extracts. Lee also does herbal consultation with people and lecturers in various places around the country. He is happy, happily married with two children and has a passion for teaching health in a way that is attractive and engaging to those who listen. And so without any further, <laughs> I am going to add... My brother, you know, I I ordered, I, I listened to one of his presentation and I ordered is um, my ear is going somewhere. And so I needed to bring back that ear in my that here in my on my head. So I ordered one of his uh, herb uh, extract and I called him up. You know, and, and he answered and I was blown away that this gentleman took the time. To, to answer me. And so we spoke and I told him that he has been on. He didn't know that he was already on the early morning health. And so I said that I spoke to him and I asked him if he would come on and present. And so he's here. Uh, welcome, my brother. How are you doing today? I'm well. Thank you, Courtney. It's great to be with you. Amen. So I'm just going to hand it over you. You have um, at least um, three hours, less than three hours to do what you want to do. You said that you were going to have a big breakfast so that you have the energy to talk. <laughs> and so over to you, my brother. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Well, I don't normally do Zoom, Zoom meetings so early, but uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here with you all. And um, I, I guess you just showed that presentation from the beginning of the last half an hour and I was just wondering maybe if anyone had any questions uh on on the uh, previous video is that okay to, yes 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 that, I launch that... into another one <laughs> yes just raise your hand if you have any question on this the video that was run and it's uh almost a whole long long and so I will continue it for next week sister Jean go ahead sister Jean and unmute yourself Good morning, good morning, uh, Mr. Wellard. Uh, it is such a joy and pleasure to be able to speak to you personally. I have always wanting to call you and talk to you. Um, however, I not too long came on and I didn't get a lot, but when you talk about hydrochloric acid, I am having issues with that and um, you know, with my nails splitting all the time and, and have this grittiness on it. And I have been using, using, um, 
I have been taking the brewer's yeast, which was recommended to me, but it doesn't seem to be helping me. And I do not understand. Sometimes my nail, you know, the bed of it going down and it just go too far down where, you know, as though it's lifting off my skin. And um, I don't know what it is, but that was what I wanted to call you about, as you meant. And, and I, I was told that I have hydrochloric issues. So um, I don't know what you have to say about that. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, that, that is actually a common symptom for low acid. Um, a lot of people think that they have too much acid because they feel like heartburn. Well, actually, it's the opposite uh, that's experienced because the low acidity causes the esophageal sphincter to relax and gives the impression that you have too much acid, but uh, actually it's the opposite. So uh, one way you can test if you have low acid is just take some um, uh, baking soda, quarter of a teaspoon in a glass of water, and just take it around the time you're going to eat and if you have any burping in the next five minutes, then that's a sign that you have low acidity. Um, and as was mentioned in the previous video, that uh, one of the best ways to improve hydrochloric acid is actually to take the, the bitter herbs, and that will stimulate um, the, the vagus nerve, to, which is connected to the stomach wall, and that's where your hydrochloric acid is accreted from the cells from the stomach wall. Um, so that will help with that. And hopefully when you get better digestion, that means your protein uh, absorption is better. And that is what your nails are made of, right? So uh, it's a it's a win-win. I don't know if I uh, said this in a video, but if you have low acidity, you can have low enzyme function. You can have low enzyme secretion from the pancreas as well. And then you're going to have a problem with uh, bile uh, salts. And that will affect the emulsification of fats as well. Some people even have such extreme situations that they lose muscle mass as well because their body isn't getting enough protein um, because of the lack of hydrochloric acid. So I would try that um, and just be aware it it's not an overnight thing. It, it will take time. Uh, the nails are very slow grow, grow in areas of the body. So uh, give yourself probably three to six months um, mm -hmm. before those nails start to look a little more how you like them to look. So try that. And thanks. So, thanks so much. What do you recommend? Question. What what herbs do you recommend, please? Yeah. So uh, bitter herbs, they, they're... There, um, there's a lot of them. So uh, there's things like wormwood, for example. There's black walnut. There's even dandelion is considered bitter. Um, it's not a strong bitter like gentian root, but um, it nevertheless has some uh, a bitter taste to it, which stimulates the vagus nerve. Um, you can also use things like milk thistle. You can use irregular. Um, you, you can use things like that in your salad, actually, a regular, um, and put some dandelion greens in there. Um, there's, there's quite a few uh, bitter herbs. You can mm -hmm. Google it, um, purslane, and, and um, yeah, even, um, uh, yeah, I would, I would try the dandelion and also maybe another stronger bitter herb like the wormwood or the black walnut, that would probably be a good good start to it. Um, Thank you so very much. You, you're welcome. Welcome. I think there's another question. Is it Vera? Yes. Go ahead. Unmute yourself, Sister Vera. Uh, yes, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I really love all of your um, work that you do. Um, I have a unique question. I didn't hear all of the previous thing about the digestion, but my question is, um, I was diagnosed with uh, esophagitis and gastritis. 
So I tried to go natural as long as I could with, because I was drinking lemon water every morning. I thought that was adding to the problem. So I stopped it. But after three months, I was still having that bad regurge or whatever it was. And I started protonics. I was also on a medication for leukemia, um, azanabutinib, which I'm sure contributed to all of that. Well, I'm off that medicine right now. And um, I'm still on the protonics. I want to know how I can get off of it or what can I do to replace it since I don't have that offender still in my body. Yeah. Well, um, again, get back to the bitter herbs, but let me give you some digestion tips, okay? Because a lot of things can be corrected just with a little knowledge, okay? So um, the gastric enzymes are secreted based upon uh, this 24 hour circadian rhythm. And so if you eat regularly, the same time every day, it helps synchronize those digestive hormones. Okay, for example, you have a hormone called ghrelin that gives you an appetite, a hunger, and it stimulates the uh, gastric juices to flow. And so if you eat regularly, it's more, um, the body will secrete those enzymes in preparation for the meal. Um, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of people have indigestion because they put food in their stomach their body's not ready for. Uh, another thing you can do is, um, is don't eat when you're stressed. This is very important. Even good food will spoil when there is anxiety. And I think this is one of the reasons why the Bible says uh, when you sit down to eat, you know, don't worry about the food and eat by faith, right? <laughs> don't think the food will hurt you because it surely will. All right. Another thing you can do, don't drink with your meals. And I'm not saying you're doing any of these. I'm just giving some um, common causes for it. Okay. So don't drink with mm -hmm. your, your meals because that will dilute gastric acid. All right. And then also try to keep your food simple. So there's not too much complexity. And of course you don't want to overeat either. Um, and then, um, another thing that can really help digestion is having uh, no meal at night. Now, I realize not everyone can do this, and this may not be for 100% of the people, especially the people who are uh, laborers, active laborers all day, hardworking, and uh, also pregnant mothers. And so common sense, take this with a bit of common sense. But um, yeah, if you skip a meal at night, it gives the digestive organs a chance to recover and prepare for the next meal um, and it reduces inflammation in the esophagus well with the esophageal sphincter um, and the stomach lining it gives the body a chance to repair itself um, and recover for the next meal so those are some of the most common things i see that people are um, having difficulty with because um, you know i'd say 90 percent of the complaints that people have in that area could be fixed by following those simple things. And, and then the bitter herbs again is very helpful for digestion. So just take them at the beginning of the meal. And that will, um, if you put anything bitter in your mouth, you know that uh, soon your mouth is full of saliva <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that, that also helps with digestion, right? But also it has a similar effect in the stomach. So um, try that and see see if that doesn't help you at all. Now, which specific bit of herbs would you suggest? I heard yeah. black walnut. As I mentioned before, uh, there's, there's burdock oh, root, there's, there's dandelion, there's uh, regular, um, you know, um, wormwood, black walnuts, um, uh, milk thistle seed, you know, those types of things. They, their class is bitter. So, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank You're you so welcome. much. You're welcome. You're uh, welcome. We have another hand up. Sister Marcia, go ahead. Thank you for that question, Sister Vera. Yes, good morning. Good morning, um, Dr. Good morning. Willard. Thank you. I want to find out about bloating. 
Um, like yes. in the morning when we wake up, generally have a flat tummy, and as soon as you eat, your stomach just blow up twice the size, even though you don't eat a lot. Um, right. what could have been some of the causes for that? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, uh, one of the primary causes to that is is a problem with digestion, and so that can actually be caused a major cause of that is actually low stomach acid again <laughs> so so um yeah so the the food uh if it doesn't get broken down sufficiently in the stomach it can cause gas to build up and that can swell the abdomen and um it also happens in the small intestine and the large intestine um but yeah so Improving gastric acid will fix that problem. Okay, um, the, um, that can have problem with um circulation if the food is not digesting properly. Would that cause um issue with circulation? Does that cause circulation problems. Um, generally, no, it's not. It's not. Um so much a problem with circulation and of course it will affect absorption of nutrition um but um you know all your organs have to a certain degree um a part with circulation of course the heart being the biggest one um but um yeah if you just want better circulation just take some time to walk and um just move <laughs> that's the best way to get the blood moving, right, is, is to walk. Mm -hmm. Jesus often told people to get up and walk, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, now there are some herbal uh, agents such as ginger that is very good for circulation, right? Okay. Um, there is um, hawthorn berry, which stimulates left myocardial contraction, and that increases the ejection fraction and causes better circulation. Mm -hmm. There's ginkgo biloba, there's cayenne pepper, but usually foods of themselves don't accelerate circulation unless okay. they're some type of a diuretic, uh, of a diaphoretic herb, such okay. as the ones I mentioned, right? Okay. Yeah, that's why cayenne is so good because yeah. it can quicken circulation. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. Thank you so much. You're, you're, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Uh, thank you, Sister. Uh, Sister Nicole, go ahead and unmute yourself. Good morning, Dr. Lillard. Uh, Lillard. It is um, a pleasure to um, to meet you, and happy Sabbath. Um, happy so Sabbath. My question is um, kind of twofold. So my daughter has been kind of suffering with a blood clot. She was diagnosed back about almost three months ago, sometime in May, early May. And um, so we're still working with her on that. So what could I, you know, herbs, could I help with, with that? Yeah, with blood clots. So um, you need things that help dissolve clots. Um, so here's one of the best ones is garlic. <laughs> so garlic has allicin and some mustard oils and they can help break up clots. Another one is cayenne pepper. Again, it's excellent for clots. Um, and then keeping the blood um, in a good state. Um, red clover is also another good one because it's a natural blood thinner. So is turmeric root. Uh, so is ginkgo biloba. So those are things. Also, as far as food goes, I highly recommend taking berries. Berries are one of the best things to, because they, they help separate the blood cells from each other and stop clotting. Um, so I would use that. Ginger is another one. Um, so these are all very good uh, agents to help keep the blood thin and prevent clotting. Now, for the red clover, is that liquid form? Uh, yeah, I would either use a tea or as an extract. Okay. 
Okay, sorry, my computer froze on me there. <laughs> okay. And my Yeah, other tea question. oil and extract are best ways to get uh, get the herb in the body because they don't require any digestion. Okay, extract. And my other question is, I have um, um, endometrial uh, hypoplasia, and I also have some polyps. So what could I use for that naturally? Polyps. I have been taking blackstrap molasses, and I try to eat figs every day to help with my fibroids. After each meal, Yeah. I try to do figs and the blackstrap molasses. Um, I haven't been too consistent with that, so that could be a issue. Okay. Uh, I probably need to ask a few more questions, but you, you're welcome to call me another time. But uh, I'll just give you a couple of suggestions. One is um, Vitex uh, or Chaseberry. Um, How do, how and do you so spell like that? V I T E X. Okay. Yeah, it's a hormonal normalizer. It's what it is. I'll I'll talk a bit about that more later on. And then I would take some turmeric root. Oh my God. Okay. And of course, um, just to explain, um, you always got to get to the cause, right? Yes. And so, so you know, uh, herbs are not a substitute for poor lifestyle habits. So. we need to use them as an adjunct therapy to a healthy lifestyle. So, um, you know, the, the Bible says the cause, which I knew not, I searched it out. And so this is where um, a good assessment comes into play because, um, you know, my, my job is actually to try to investigate the, the causes and try to ascertain what we can do to remedy those. And then you use the herbs, um, to bring the body back to where it should be. And usually that's only for a few months until the person is, you know, feeling better, their symptoms are starting to improve. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, give me a, give me a call another time because I, I don't want to put you on Okay. the spot asking you dozens of questions. Okay. So how can I reach you? Do you have <laughs> an email address? uh, yeah, I, I can put my email. Uh, let me see here. Uh, where do we share? There we go. Okay. Yeah, I'll just put my email up here. It's lee.hhp at gmail.com. All right. And uh, I'll put my website up here. If any of you, you can reach me through there as well. Uh, why, not, why don't I go all the way and I'll put my phone number. There we go. Just, just uh, don't all call me at once. <laughs> okay. All right. So I put that in the chat for, for you all. All right. Well, thank you for that question. Yeah. Yes, we have one more question and um, for, from Sister Veronica. Thank you, Sister Nicole, for that question. Thank you, Go Nicole. ahead and unmute yourself, Thank Sister you. Veronica. Thank you, Brother Lee, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Go ahead. Good, good morning and happy Sabbath, uh, Dr. Wellard. I have a question here. I, I'm getting confused a little bit because um, if cayenne pepper is often used for so many things and also suggested whenever you're doing something because it also helps It's like a catalyst almost. Um, and even how you were sharing, you know, the 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 cayenne pepper will help with, um, I think you said earlier, I met a mist I heard you say cayenne for, um, I don't know, was it digestion? I'm not sure. My question is, there's some, because of that, because cayenne is, Uh, suggested to use because it'll help whatever you're using to actually work. Some people add it to their food for that purpose. They don't see it like adding, like they don't, pr even though it gives that spice, they don't, it's not like they're adding hot sauce or the thick, um, 
but they see it say, well, we're going to add a little cayenne because it's going to help with digestion or because it's going to help with blah, blah, blah. And they just put it in every main course that they make. Um, and I was trying to, and not a lot, not a lot, uh, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm trying, trying to balance that or just make sure that I'm not saying, thinking one thing, saying one thing and doing another. And then how do you balance, like, how do you balance that with the irritants that Spirit of Prophecy says? Can you help me figure that out, yeah. please? That's a, that's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, when when Alan was talking about irritants, okay, uh, she's talking about things that stimulate the bottom of the brain, the animal passions, the, the appetite, the sex drive, uh, the emotions, negative emotions. Uh, so those things can possibly be um, stimulated through certain spices, okay? Now, we've got to understand something about spices. Not all spices are the same. So, um, for example, garlic is considered a spice. Uh, ginger is considered a spice, right? And yet, um, Ellen White took those herbs, um, but it was perfectly fine. Now she does mention a few specific herbs when it comes to irritants, okay? One was black pepper, okay? Now black pepper does irritate the gastric mucosa. All right, now um, getting back to cayenne. Cayenne is not something I generally recommend on a daily basis. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll share this story with you. Um, this is just a testimony. So there's there's no science behind this. Okay. Um, but uh, I have a good friend of mine. He was over in India. And in India, they put, um, they put um, cayenne in quite a lot of things. And him and his wife, they, they're very, they have a very good relationship. They um, love each other. They don't have arguments. You know, it's like a perfect couple, you could say, in a way. And they noticed that um, over time, they started getting irritated with each other. And they started getting a little, you know, a bit angry sometimes when things didn't go the way they wanted. And they noticed that... Uh, it was because of the cayenne. <laughs> when they stopped the cayenne, everything was fine. <laughs> so, so um, that, that's an example. What we okay? We have to differentiate between what is a medicine may not always be indicated as a food. Okay, so um, you know I don't generally recommend cayenne as as something just to put on your food every day. Now, I do see the benefit of it. Now, it depends how much you take. If if you're taking it to the point where you're sweating profusely, then probably taking too much. And uh, I know there are people out there that recommend a bucket of cayenne. It doesn't matter how much you take. It, it's not going to have any adverse effects. Well, I disagree with that. I think... Um, cayenne, dependent on the intensity and the heat, it can cause a little issues. It may may not be physiological. It may not be that you've got heartburn or you, you're having nausea and that type of thing. But it is possible that some of these hotter peppers, and cayenne has different grades of heat units. And it can be if you uh, take too much of it, it could certainly uh, cause a little irritation. Um, now, cayenne should not be taken in the body by itself. I just want to make that clear. And the reason for that is because it's too concentrated. And um, the body will not appreciate that. So if you're going to put cayenne in your food, just use a little bit. Um, and you notice in places that they use a lot of peppers that are very hot. 
they have hot tempers generally too. <laughs> All right. So I use it really, I recommend it for people as something that they can take to help them with different conditions, but I'm not advocating taking large amounts of it. And if it's certainly affecting your character and it's causing you to lose your patience, then probably want to back off of it. Okay. Um, so getting back to the spices, spices, it can be good or they can be bad. And, um, you know, uh, there is a herb called cinnamon, as many of you, or all of you probably heard of it. Um, and cinnamon can be a gastric irritant as well. All right. And uh, there are two different kinds. There's Ceylon and there's Cassia. Cassia is much more irritating than Ceylon. So I generally recommend Ceylon. Um, so, yeah, if it's causing you a problem, even though it may not cause someone else a problem, if it's causing you a problem, then it's better to avoid it completely. And so I would say the balance here with the spirit of prophecy is, you know, use some of these things of medicine. When Ellen White's talking about these foods in councils and diets of foods, she's she's talking about them being eaten as foods, right? She's not talking about using them as medicines for specific things. Case in point, like nutmeg. Nutmeg is very toxic. It's got a toxic um, alkaloid called merastasin. It can cause hallucinogenic effects if you take it more than five grams. But it works amazingly for stroke recovery, paralysis, facial paralysis. And it can bring you back out of that in a pretty short amount of time. So I only recommend it for that particular condition. Um, but I don't recommend it to be used in an apple pie. <laughs> so I, I hope that makes sense. Um, I, I'm not, when I... When I recommend some of these herbs, some of them are just for specific conditions. They're not actually something I would recommend as an ongoing daily food. Uh, thank, thank you for that question and answer. I have some um, some question in the chat. Uh, I see your hand, Sister Cheryl, just give me a chance. And so one of the question is, um, Jackie Yvonne writes, good morning, Dr. Willard. Can you help me understand what supplement fats, one serving size, one dropper, one milli means? So they're asking about the, um, the serving size when it comes on to the dropper, when you press that dropper. Is it, and I know when you look at that dropper, it has um, lines on it or scales on it. So they basically want to, want to know what um, a drop is, um, uh, one milli, milli is on yeah, a yeah. drop. Yes. Okay, so uh, just to explain for those who are listening, um, we have this, what we call pipette. It's a tube, a glass tube in the bottle. And depending on how big the bottle is, it depends on how big that pipette is. But uh, we have them in our four ounce uh, bottles. And one milliliter is basically usually half of what goes up that pipette. All right. So uh, when we say dropper full, it's really technically only half. <laughs> okay. And that's usually one ml. And so um, sometimes it has markings, a line on yes. the dropper itself saying one ml okay so um that that can equate to about 25 drops roughly but i don't tell people to count the drops so i just say just a drop of all sometimes people misunderstand me and they think i'm saying a drop a drop one drop <laughs> okay so yeah um some sometimes uh <laughs> people don't get the effects they want because they're taking one or two drops a day <laughs> instead of dropperfuls. Yeah, sometimes we want the, I know that um, sickness takes time to develop and we That's want right. to get rid of it instantly, but sometimes yeah. it takes time to disappear. And so we have to be patient. If we take one or two days, we say, oh, it's not working and that's it. No, you have to 
go through the cycle and uh, reversing what it takes years. It might be 10, 20 years for that sickness to develop. And so you have That's to right. be patient. Yes. Yes. Um, the another question, there's another question by uh, Samuel. Um, it says, what to use to clear up sinus? I am breathing through my mouth for a long time. Mm. Okay. So with sinus, um, I, I need to know is it an allergy? If it happened in some type of allergy. So is there anything that can, so the, the, in essence, the nose is shutting down, saying, hey, we can't take in any more here through the nose. Uh, we're going to use the mouth until we fix whatever issue is happening to the, perhaps the sinus. Is there anything that they can, how does the gut affect the sinus? Is the gut affect the sinus? Is there any, uh, what can be taken to clear that sinus? Yeah, so... It depends on the cause of it, right? You always got to find out the cause. But as far as clearing the sinus, um, for, for most people, um, you know, there's things like eucalyptus oil, you know, doing a steam inhalation. They can really open up the sinus passages. Sometimes there's too much mucus secretion and the body does that to protect itself. And that often is connected with what we eat. Um, so there's a lot of foods out there that are mucus forming. So, uh, things like dairy products, for example, uh, refined white sugars are also a big cause. Um, so I'd have to look at the diet as well. Um, I don't know if the gentleman has some polyps in his nose that, um, can, can be, um, can affect the passage of air. Um, but um, you can do a sinus drain and there is certain things that you can put up your nose to help with that. Um, it's actually under your cheekbone. You can push up underneath there and it can drain your sinus. Uh, it's a little painful, but it can, can help you with that. Um, and then there's saline solutions you can put up your nose that can help with that, if there's bacteria in the nose that's causing the body to over secrete mucus, then, you know, and that's something I would recommend. Um, yeah, and then there's things like ginger can help and there's hydrotherapy, hot and cold treatments to the nasal area, you know, that uh, some fermentations, they can help accelerate blood flow and open up those passages. Thank you for that answer. So there is, uh, we have uh, D.A. Scott, and it's, uh, it, the person writes, my 11-year-old granddaughter's stomach is very extended. She's an asthmatic, suffers with acid symptoms. What would you recommend? I have been suspicious that it's a digestive issue. As her yeah. father also has that problem, so intent to add the bitter herbs. Any other recommendation? Yeah, yeah. Um, if find it out what you. she eats. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know if the brother was listening to the digestive talk, and but um, yeah, the the fact that you have acid, experience acid. It's usually indicative that you have low acid. Um, it's it's a bit ironic. It confuses the brain. Think that if you experience acid, that you have too much acid. I've never met anyone that has too much acid. Mm -hmm. If you if you see your hydrochloric acid should be between one and three in the stomach, which is extremely acidic, and that acid is what's used to break down the food. And when it is insufficient, then that's when you feel the acid going up your esophagus. But it's very weak acid compared to what it should be. But nevertheless, it causes discomfort. But I would look at her, her diet. Um, you know, the, the principles I mentioned before about not... Uh, here's another one for kids, especially 11-year-olds. 
I have an eleven year old, by the way. <laughs> we 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 never uh, snack in our house. Uh, snacking is one of the biggest causes for kids to have um, problems with gastric acid. All right. And as I mentioned before, eat regularly, eat on time, don't drink with your meals, um, and eat good food. And I'd say nine times out of 10, that would fix it. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Sister Cheryl says, I have my finger on the right hand got stick with a plant. I know it is stiff and the whole hand is now affected. That stick happened months ago. I tried several things. The finger can't bend. The hand ache, aches in and out. So basically something, a plant, some, I don't know what sticks her, stick her hand, and it causes a reaction. And it's, I guess it's spreading, and she has tried everything with that hand. Is there anything, I don't know, charcoal uh, comes to mind. It might need hot and cold. To um to 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 cause blood flow to that location. Any recommendation for Sister Cheryl from Barbados? Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm curious to what stung it. <laughs> but, Sister, uh, Sister Cheryl, yeah. um, can you explain? Please unmute yourself and explain yes, your situation. A blessing and a pleasant Sabbath, one law. Yes, doctor. Um, is a plant. I don't know what plant it is. It is not like a palm plant, a big palm tree from me here in the Caribbean. And it is this plant that you could, it's got like a, a, a top, it's got like a tarp and top of it, and you could break it off and right on the plant and draw hearts on it and write your name on it, anything. And then when it throws, it never removes it. It dries and it stays there forever. So I was demonstrating it to someone that so they never know about it. And they're trying to break off the tarp from the top of the plant and it slips the top me and this middle finger. And now the finger I try using the the, the charcoal. I try and everything and the hand just getting worse. It takes it hot and then much I train drinking blue different herbs and I and the fingers bang you see middle finger just no one bang not affecting the other hand I don't know no, if it caused it so definitely some kind of virus it just but it just puzzling to me okay so I, I couldn't quite hear everything but um did did you have do you have any barbs that went into your Hand. It is. It, it got like it, it gets stick with the like, the flip off the the plant itself. It, this plant has got like a thorn, a sharp thorn to the top. Sharp thorns. Okay, so yeah. thorn went in there. Yeah, and stick it, and it bleed, and I squeeze out the blood. Okay. But no, I rub it. I put candle grease. I do some of everything. I even try the hot and cold treatment with it, so salt and water. Yeah, the fingers just keep on hurting. Okay, okay. So, um, I would, <clears throat> I would try using some clay, and the reason for that is because clay is the most powerful in drawing out through the skin, uh, even much more than charcoal. Um, it can also help reduce the inflammation and pain. So uh, you want to mix uh, one part clay, three parts water. Um, okay. Clay I would recommend would be either the bentonite clay or the green clay. Um, now, do you have any fever associated with this? No. Fever. You can see it's slightly hot. The finger area is slightly hot. Okay. But Maybe it'd be best to reach out to me because um, I'm having a hard time hearing you. So um, I'm sorry about that. But um, yeah, give me a call or, or shoot me an email. But I will try clay. And that's very, very powerful. Um, and it could help pull that, pull that back out if it's embedded deeply beneath the skin. So give that a, give that a try. Thank you.
Sorry, I had a hard time picking up everything you were saying there. Thank you, Sister Cheryl. I dropped his number in the chat so you can follow up with that number. Um, there was a question. There's so many questions. Um, um, there is a question here. Uh, let me see, um, Sister Veronica. Someone asks, what can be done for chronic venous insufficiency? Oh, good question. Okay, so I would use a uh, hawthorn berry. Hawthorn berry, that would be my number one go-to herb for that. Um, and then, of course, exercise. You can't, can't do away with that. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I teach botanical medicine, but I always want people to understand that, you know, it's the uh, it's the whole package, right? We're looking at all the laws of health and herbs are just part of that. They come under the category of nutrition. But um, with insufficiency uh, of blood flow, that is one of the best things I would I would use. Now, if there's associated swelling, lots of edema that's happening, then I would use some dandelion to help um, get rid of excess fluid. Okay, thank, thanks for that. Um, P-T-E-R-Y-G-I-U-M, it's a herb. I think it's petridium, I believe, P T E R. Y G I U M. Oh, yeah, tarragon. Yes, yeah. yes, same thing. It's a, it is, it, it is a gut issue. So the person says, um, Dr. Willard, eye problem, and they mention that herb, and then it says it is a gut issue or the eyes. That's that's the question. That yeah, the gut issue, the eyes. So, wow. so I wonder if it's an eyes or is it a gut, gut issue? Yes. So it, it doesn't necessarily need to be digestion, but food has a big part into how our eyes receive nourishment, right? Um, now, one of the things that can really affect the eyes that we don't often talk about, and that is stress because there's six muscles around each eye and stress puts tension upon those muscles and causes all kinds of visual distortion to take place. But um, yes, uh, nutrition does play a very, very important role with the, with the eyes. Um, in fact, uh, yeah, the best herb for eyes that I recommend is actually uh, bilberry. The bilberry can help with uh, improving vision. It can help with cataracts or preventing cataracts. It can help with glaucoma. Uh, it can also help. I've even seen it help with macular degeneration. Um, so that's usually my go-to herb um, when it comes to improving the eyes. Now, if there's inflammation in the eyes, I would recommend uh, there's a herb called eyebright. That's very good for that. Um, and then nettle is another good one for the eyes. It's high in vitamin A. So those those are the best herbs I know for, for eyes. But you you got to also look at the diet. And there are definitely dietary factors that will affect blood flow to the eye. And there's conditions like diabetes type 2 that will affect the um the microcirculation in the eye, hypertension affects the eye. There's a lot of different conditions that affect the eye. So again, you may want to reach out to me at some point and 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 maybe we could talk further about that. Amen. Uh, another question by um, Sister Price. She said, um, Pleasant Sabbath. Dr. Willard, my husband had a stroke last year. Do you know what he can use to assist in helping him in the recovery, speech and mobility. Right, okay. So again, you need circulatory herbs to help with stroke recovery. So ginger is a good one. Um, 
Ginkgo biloba. And then uh, also, uh, you know, immediately after stroke, I often recommend cayenne. Um, not something you necessarily have to use permanently, but it does definitely help with stroke recovery. Um, if there's facial paralysis, the, the nutmeg, but I, I need to talk to you about that just to explain how it's used because you, you want to use it the right way. And it is a toxic herb, so I don't like to recommend it without giving specific instructions to how to use it. Um, but just getting mobile, you know, let, let me let me keep this really simple. Okay, the Bible says that the life is in the blood. And we're told that perfect health depends on perfect circulation. Mm -hmm. So the way the body heals, it's always the same. It's in the blood. So anytime you cut off blood flow, reduce blood flow, uh, you're going to have a harder time recovering. And so um, I always suggest that people improve the circulation as a way to normalize um, health. And so that that's where the herbs can help, the exercise can help, hydrotherapy can help, massage can help. They all work on that same principle of moving blood flow. All right. So um, every cell of the body needs to be within one millimeter of blood supply or it will die. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've got to keep, keep that in perspective when it comes to disease, because um, a lot of people don't realize the significance of the blood in recovery from from disease and so um so get active use things that stimulate blood flow and you'll be surprised how quickly you can recover okay so thank you for that answer um sister nicole says what can you do for uti uti and UTI. alopecia ear loss okay yes Okay, so with UTIs, some of the best herbs to use are uh, things like corn silk. There's also um, buku. Um, buku is another excellent one for UTIs. And then, uh, so uh, Uva Ursi. Uva Ursi is the other one I highly recommend. Now, it depends on what's caused it. So UTIs um, usually can occur when there's a change of pH. So when I, I lived in the Philippines, we um, had some lemon trees and I didn't think you could overdose on lemon. So I would take two cups of lemon juice a day <laughs> and I ended up with UTIs. And I didn't realize it was connected with the lemon juice. And what the lemon was doing was it was actually changing the pH in my urethra and causing bacterial infection. And uh, so I ended up doing sitz baths. Now, a sitz bath is where you immerse your pelvic area in hot and cold water. So usually you do two minutes hot. 30 seconds cold you do that four times so you have to get these big washing tubs like you get from walmart fill it with hot water and have a cold one right next to it and you have to just move yourself from one tub to the next tub it's a little bit of effort but it does pay off but within 10 minutes my uti was gone and both both occasions and i've recommended that for other people and it it's very effective yeah, if you do a hot and cold sits bath. Um, now, for serious persistent cases, I had a lady who had a really bad UTI, and everything uh, the natural wasn't doing doing its job or doing it to the point where she could be back to normal. So, uh, for really stubborn UTIs, I recommend taking some Alimed. Now, Alimed is a very strong garlic concentrate. It's medicinal grade 
um, and uh, it tends to be quite expensive. We we do not sell it, but um, I I recommend you talk to Walt Cross about that. He's he's um, got a really good store and supply set. So um, so that's for really persistent UTIs that nothing else will work with. But usually those herbs, either Ursi, Buku, Quan Silk, they do a good job in helping. And if you combine that with a sitz bath, you'll be probably uh, nine times out of 10 recovered in a few minutes. Also, she mentioned uh, hair loss. Oh, hair loss. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. All right. So, you know, someone years ago asked me, can you make something for hair? And I, I just wasn't interested whatsoever because I, I didn't want to be seen as some gimmicky herbalist, you know, sell, selling snake oil. So, yeah, I, think so I didn't even bother about it. But I was helping some ladies with their thyroid and they would tell me that their hair is growing back. And so I looked at these herbs I was giving people uh, when it came to helping with hair and ended up making a formula out of it. Um, so just to explain something here, there's all kinds of different causes for hair loss, okay? The biggest causes of hair loss are usually a change of sex hormones, also stress hormones, and nutrition. Those are the three biggies. Now, there are other causes like radiation. Some ladies can pull their hair and damage their hair beds and there's chemical dyes and different other things. But for the most part, those, those are the main ones. So uh, we use adaptogens. These are herbs that help with stress and um, also nutritional support. We use some nettle. In fact, we had a gentleman who was completely bald. He's just started taking nettle and his hair grew back completely. Um, we've had other people who've been completely bald, whose hair's grown back in their, from their thirties, you know, some people have been bald for many years and has grown back. Now I will not say that this, there's one thing that works a hundred percent of the time for a hundred percent of people, but, um, so far, I think we've seen between, I'd say 85 to 90%, uh, results with it. And, that varies for some people. It's maybe slight hair growth for other people. Um, you know, it fully grows back. So I'm actually taking my own formula right now. <laughs> but uh, yes, so um, we use adaptogen. So ashwagandha we use, we use rhodiola root and some nettle. And nettle is the highest in nutrition. So that seems to be helping. Okay. Thank, thanks for that. Um, Sister Petals is asking, does fatty liver have an effect on the GI tract or can it be reversed? It does, but it's mostly uh, receiving the brunt of the abuse from the GI tract. So let me explain. I did a talk on fatty liver and it, it, it will shock you, this statistic, but there's about 100 to 110 million American adults that have fatty liver. <laughs> if, you're, if you're overweight, you have an 85% chance of having fatty liver. All right. So, um, yes, and it's usually caused. Now, this is the non-alcoholic form, right? And it's usually caused through refined carbs, processed carbohydrates is the, the number one cause of that. And fatty liver, yes, once you get a fatty liver, then over a few years, several years, it becomes inflamed. And then you end up with cirrhosis of the liver mm. over a few more years. And then you end up killing your liver all right so yes uh, if you've got a fatty liver that can be reversed okay cirrhosis of the liver is harder to help uh, the liver is very robust organ it can 
withstand uh, up to 90% liver damage and still regrow back. Uh, it's it's incredibly um, resilient organ. But um, fatty liver does compromise the liver's function and it makes it harder for the liver to do its job. It has over 600 known functions to, to the liver. And so it's the largest organ of, of um, elimination besides the skin. And it, but it's incredibly powerful as a detoxifying organ. So yes, if you get a fatty liver, you may have a harder time, uh, you know, with certain functions of the liver, or at least keeping up with its its tasks and and, and being optimum in its efficiency. Uh, it doesn't mean that you'll get necessarily disease straight away, but it's laying a foundation for disease to occur down the road. So take care of your liver and your liver will take care of you. <laughs> amen. amen. Um, we, are, we have a special guest today and um, I, I think it's, it's turned out into question and answer uh, time. And so we are continuing the question. There's a lot more question and just wanted to do a pause.